friends and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. Let me introduce myself. My name is Wendy. I am with Inspire Ministries and I love to do Christian content videos just like the one that you are going to watch today. Today I invite you just to come along with me as we dig in the Word of God to get into a Bible study. If you have your Bibles handy, I would love for you to go get it, get yourself a beverage, meet me back here, and let's just have an old-fashioned Bible study together. Today we are going to be talking about a tough subject, one that I think that it behooves all of us to investigate a little bit further. We are going to be in the New Testament, and we are going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. So again, if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to go get it. What you need to know is that I primarily read out of the NLT, but I use a bunch of different versions, and so you might hear me switch from version to version as I am referencing verses, but I'll have all of the verses that I am using today resourced and referenced down below for you to note as you follow along with me. Now, I want to set this up a little bit today. Today's video is going to be a little bit longer, but I want to set up for you what is happening, what is taking place here in the book of Hebrews. Now, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 challenges his hearers to endure following Jesus. The one is the supreme example of faithfulness, right? Jesus is our model of faithfulness. And the writer of Hebrews does this in three major themes in Hebrews 12. The first one is imitating him in suffering, so imitating Jesus in his suffering. The second one is enduring under God's discipline. And then the third major theme here is living at peace with others. Now, my Bible breaks down the chapter in these parts. The first one is enduring by keeping your eyes on Jesus. The second one, enduring God's loving discipline. The third one is enduring by rejecting a corrupt life. The fourth one is the contrast between two covenants. And then the final one is a final warning. For today, I want to focus on the section of scripture that talks about enduring a rejection of a corrupt life. And then more specifically on how we are to watch that no root of bitterness grows up in us or around us. So let's just dive right in. Hebrews 12 verse 15 is our landing pad for today, and the verse itself says this, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Now, the writer of Hebrews is not clearly known, nor is it clear who the recipients were entirely. However, many scholars agree that this book was originally written as a sermon. Some agree that because this book circulated with the letters of Paul, that Paul would likely be the writer of this, but many in Rome disagree. The reasons for this is primarily because the writing style is inconsistent with Paul's. The vocabulary and the theological themes are all incompatible with Paul, and most notably, Hebrews uses 169 words not found elsewhere in the New Testament, which we know that Paul himself wrote about 75% of. We also know that Paul was used to using the same vocabulary over and over again, so so the likelihood is that Paul was not the author of Hebrews. Many possibilities of authorship have been attributed to such people like Philip, Priscilla, Luke, Barnabas, and Jude. However, whoever it was, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, one thing is certain, this author was deeply concerned. He was a deeply concerned Christian leader who addressed his readers urgently and with passion. When we read it, we get this sense that this was a passionate pastor who longed to appeal to the heart and the mind of those listening and those who might be changed as a result of their Christian commitment. It is obvious by a look at the book of Hebrews that the recipients of this message were struggling to maintain their Christian commitment, and they were likely being persecuted for their faith. Some were faltering spiritually, while others apparently turned their backs on their faith altogether. 
One central lesson all throughout the book of Hebrews is this word enduring. Enduring in their public profession of Jesus Christ. And the part I want to focus on today is enduring the Christian life by rejecting or turning away from a corrupt lifestyle. Again, Hebrews 15, 12, verse 15 says this, Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you and corrupt many. The design of the church community was in part to look after each other so that no one fails to receive the grace of God. I wonder, does this look like our capital C church today? Does it look like how we operate today? Are we concerned in the slightest about looking out for one another so that no one within our community fails to receive the grace of God? Because even in our churches, we can be deceived. You see, just because a person claims that they are a Christian doesn't mean they are. And according to this verse, it is the responsibility of the ones inside, the ones who have received grace and accepted the gift of salvation, to lovingly look after those who are living immoral lives, those who are, in a sense, being deceived, those who think they're in but they're really not, those who are living sinful lives and it's threatening to separate them forever from the Father that they claim to love. These are hard truths to read about, but ones we have to get into the habit of digging in and to looking more into. Are we concerned with our brothers and sisters who are outside the faith? And again, I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about those who have actively pronounced that they have a disbelief in God. I'm talking about the ones who say they're living for God, but are living a lifestyle that is in complete contradiction to the Christian lifestyle. So for practical example, who am I talking about? I'm talking about the ones who come to church on Sunday, you know the ones, hands raised in worship, amening in the crowd, and then live Monday through Saturday as though Christ didn't die for them or for the freedom that they have in Christ. Those who refrain from forgiveness. Those who wear the burden of Christianity publicly and yet live immoral lives, corrupt lives, and sinful lives all the rest of the days of the week. Those who compromise Christ's reputation by abusing the freedom we possess as God-fearing, obedient children of God. Now let's go on. The second part of Hebrews 12, verse 15, says this, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up, troubling you, corrupting many. Watch out. This is a phrase that is a very important one. This phrase, watch out, or in other translations is translated to be careful, is this Greek word epikespio, and it means to exercise oversight, care for, visit, to oversee by implication, or to beware. Epi means over, and skopos means look. Isn't that fantastic? One of my commentaries says it this way, it is meaning to take supervisory oversight. I wonder how much our lives would look, how much different our lives would be, how much further advanced we might be if we took serious supervisory oversight of our spiritual lives. The writer here is basically saying, be careful, watch out, exercise oversight in this. Beware that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up, and not only just to trouble you, but to corrupt many. Deuteronomy 29, 18 warns this. In that verse, it says this, Make sure that there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose hearts turn away from the Lord our God to go and worship other gods of other nations. Make sure that there is no root, there's that word again, that root among you that produces such bitter poison. The warning was to not even have unbelief or ungodliness living among you. Take a look at what the commentator Matthew Henry says about this. Now, it's a lengthy 
commentary, but I want to read it to you because I feel like it is so important and so necessary for us to investigate. Matthew Henry says this, The sinner is described as one whose heart turns away from God. There the mischief begins in the evil heart of unbelief, which inclines men to depart from the living God to dead idols. Even to this sin, men are now tempted when drawn aside to their own lusts and their fancies. Such men are roots that bear gall and wormwood. They are weeds which, if left alone, overspread the whole field. Satan may, for a time, disguise the bitter morsel so that you shall not have the natural taste of it. But at the last day, if not before, the true taste shall be discerned. Notice the sinner's security in sin. Though he hears the words of the curse, yet even when he thinks himself safe in the wrath of God. There is scarcely a threatening in all of the book of God more dreadful than this one. Oh, that presumptuous sinners could read, would read, and tremble, for it is a real declaration of the wrath of God against ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. Wow. Unbelief sneaks in and it inclines us to depart from the living God to dead idols. In other words, when we allow corruption in our homes, into our lives, into our churches, we are inviting, maybe not even knowingly, but we are inviting the inclination of evil. They are considered to be like roots. Scripture tells us in Matthew 15 verse 19, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, and sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. So in other words, thoughts lead to words which eventually lead us to actions. So our care must not only be exclusive to our deeds, which is considered to be like the fruit above the ground, we must seek to reach the hidden root which grows in the soul unseen, the one that has the capability of harming us and not only destroying us or harming us or causing danger to us, but also to corrupt other people. Look also back to what Matthew Henry said in his commentary. He says, Satan may for a time disguise this bitter morsel so that you shall not have the natural taste of it. God, in other words, may allow Satan to use a time in our lives, overgrown by weeds, to be disguised as something good and even justifiable, when in actuality it's killing us. This is why it is so important to keep guard over our thoughts and our minds and our hearts, to watch out, to keep guard over our spiritual lives, what comes in and what goes out. And here, Scripture is warning us to make sure that there is no one like this even among you, because it is then where there is a poisonous root that grows up in and among us. Wow. We are to be careful to watch over anyone who maintains any evil disposition. Things like covetedness, worldly ambition, anger, malice, envy, revenge, all of these things, they seek to destroy the peace and the harmony within our Christian society. Now, I know what you may be saying. You may be saying to yourself, but Wendy, aren't we supposed to sit with sinners the way that Jesus did? Isn't our call to go out and commune with the filthy in the world in an effort to conform them to Christ? Yes, it's true in part, but there's a warning here that we have to take heed of. There's a warning for those of us who have been called to endure the threat of corrupt living. And by the way, that is every one of us who calls ourselves a believer in Jesus Christ. And there is a price to pay when we compromise with evil. And truth be told, we all have to know our bent. We all have to understand what it is that we have a natural tendency towards. I don't know about you, but I have been around people who are bitter, people that are angry, people that have a chip on their shoulders. And I don't know about you, but I often do not feel strong around them. I feel very weak. I feel as though I am more corrupted by their evil behavior than I am ever to bring them into my side with being in love with Jesus. And so you have to know your bent. You have to know those weak spots that you have within your life. Know who you can be safe around. Know your bent. Know what kinds of ways 
ways that you tend to lead when you are around corrupt company? Do they have influence over you? Do you feel yourself getting bitter with bitter people? Do you feel yourself to be anxious? Do you feel yourself to be overwhelmed? Those are the things I believe that you need to keep watch over. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. It says this, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. And the following verse, verse 12, says this, It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is our responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. So let's look back. Who are those people that we aren't even to associate with? Why? Because we have to know our bent. We have to know what kinds of dangerous, slippery slides we can find ourselves in. Sexual sin, those people who are involved in sexual sin or who are greedy or worship idols or are abusive or are drunkards or cheat people, don't even eat with such people. We must be careful with whom we choose to sit with, do life with, allow to speak into our lives. We must watch out for any poisonous root and give proper supervisory oversight to that which my attention is given. Be careful. Keep watch over. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, something he told his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 41 was this, keep watch and pray so that you will not be given to temptation. Now, I have read this verse a thousand times if I've read it once, and I feel that every single time I read it, I get something new from it. Watch and pray. This was the way out of temptation. This was the answer to watch and pray, to watch, to be alert, to be vigilant. The word here in Greek is to keep awake as though you have the danger of falling fast asleep. Don't fall asleep. Why? Because danger comes in the dark. Temptation comes when we are least expecting it. And so there is this call to watch to give supervisory oversight so that we do not fall into danger, temptation, sin. We are to be careful. But to be careful over what, though? According to this verse, careful over corruption, either in doctrine or in practice. Why? Because it's the root of all bitterness. That's why which in springing up in us, this root of bitterness that springs up in us, would not only harm us, but would help to harm others, to corrupt others, to defile others. And boy, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be responsible for this. Do you? According to my commentary, and I made a list, these are the poisonous roots that can grow among us. The first one is those who openly sin against God. The second one is those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And I want you to remember that one because that's going to be our next Bible study is what does it mean to actually hold the truth in righteousness? Are we in danger as believers, you and I, of holding the truth in unrighteousness? You bet we are. And we're going to talk about that next week. The third one is those who treat sacred things with contempt. Fourth is those who despise or make light of spiritual blessings. In other words, those who forget to be grateful. I just did a Bible study last week on the life of Hezekiah. I will link it up here above so you can check that out. This is one who made very light of the spiritual blessings that he was given. Number five, those who neglect God's worship. Number six, those who speak unreverently of him. It is one of the greatest causes of bitter roots in us, I believe. I always say this. It is lacking to hold him in esteem, being in awe of him as we should be. And then number seven, the final one, is those who have no sense of God, those who go about their day and they have no awareness that God is in their midst. According to my commentary, those are ranked among the most flagrant and vicious of all sinners. 
Look at 1 Timothy 1.9. It says this, For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father and mother and commit other murders. Further on in Hebrews 12, verse 16, according to the King James Version, it says this, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Esau was the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, and the brother of Jacob, who ended up selling his firstborn birthright to his brother in exchange for a single meal. Esau was known as a whiner, a complainer, and he ended up suffering because of his major decision in his life. And here in Hebrews 12, 16, he is considered to be a profane person. And I want you to look at this verse for a minute because it's really interesting. Profane means this, irreverent to anything sacred, polluted, or not pure. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for food. He showed the greatest what is considered profanity for this in the family of Abraham, which in the family of Abraham, the birthright entitled the eldest son to spiritual as well as temporal favors. And yet he lost all of that when he sold that right to his brother. And I wanna note something even more interesting here. It's this word profanity. You know, in our culture today, we have made this word profanity to mean only severe things like sexual immorality, swearing, those kinds of things. But have we made it to look worse to accept our behavior as irreverent? In other words, have we downplayed the word to make it seem like it's only reserved for more severe sins, when scripture is clear that it also means those who are irreverent? Irreverent means without due respect or veneration, disrespectful or flippant. This is part of what God calls the things that defile us. When we don't hold God in the high esteem that he is due, when we are irreverent towards him, when we don't consider him as the great God, when we do not sit in awe of his majesty, these are in fact some of the very things that defile you and me. Matthew 15 verses 18 and 19 says this, the words you speak come from the heart. That is what defiles you. For from your heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. So we see the sins that Jesus condemned the most in the Gospels, including selfishness, pride, unbelief, hypocrisy, greed, unforgiveness, hatred, disobedience, judging others, and impurity. They all stem from an improper reverence of God. It's interesting that the same word here in Hebrews, epikospiko, is the same word found in 1 Timothy 3.1. Out of the New King James Version, it says this, This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Bishop is an overseer, to bishop over one's life. So you and I are to be a bishop, an overseer over our own hearts. It's interesting to note that the role of a bishop is to watch over, to direct, to guide, to correct, and to give oversight. He is held responsible for the good as well as the bad that occurs within the body of the church, just the way that you and I are overseers or bishops in our own lives. We have oversight over our hearts. We, you and I, are responsible for our own emotions and our own reactions. Think of this example, if you will. If a person does something to offend us, hurt us emotionally, God holds us, the believer in Jesus Christ, personally responsible for whether that offense takes root in our minds, in our hearts, and eventually takes root inside of us to destroy us, or whether we brush it off entirely. Have you ever thought about that? When someone offends you, when someone talks bad about you, when someone slanders your name, when someone is mean to your family, when someone is disrespectful to you, when someone just pulls out in front of you in traffic, you're responsible. God holds you responsible for how that bitter root is going to take root in your life. 
I heard a Christian speaker the other day giving a brief message on forgiveness, and I agreed with most of what she was saying until she got to the part where she said this, and I quote, she said, you don't need to be a doormat. Forgive people, but don't let them walk all over you. You have the right to cut them out of your life as you don't deserve to carry around that offense. Can I tell you, as much as there is a portion of truth in this, this is a very dangerous way to behave as a cross-carrying Christian. And it's in that attitude in which we hold this truth, our freedom. I read a quote just this morning by the great Charles Spurgeon that I think goes along perfect with this text, and it says this, It is one thing to be valiant for the truth and quite another thing to be bitter for your own opinion. Wow. We need to allow the Word of God to be the end-all, be-all in our life. Let the Bible inform us. Let the truth speak for itself. The world doesn't need any more of my opinion on what the Word says. We are not responsible, listen, for how poorly someone treats us. You might remember how terribly they treated Jesus, King Jesus, and yet through all of his harsh treatment, all of his unjustified poor treatment, he never sinned. He never gave way to the temptation to retaliate, to complain, to hold a grudge, or demand better treatment. Scripture tells us in Isaiah 53, 7 that he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. God will hold you and I personally responsible for the way that we allow the root to grow within our hearts, causing it to reveal bitterness, which not only has the ability to hurt us, but take along others for the ride. We can choose to let that seedling sink into our souls and take root, or we can opt to let it bypass us altogether. As I was doing some studying into the word bitterness, into what is bitterness, I found some interesting things on how it works. Bitterness, it says, doesn't overwhelm us all at once. Instead, it grows a little here and a little there until it finally takes over the whole body. My commentary says the nature of bitterness has not only defiled the carrier, it defiles those associated with the carrier. And that, my friends, is what this verse is talking about. This is where the danger lies. Again, have you ever been around a bitter person for very long? I have. And I have often said that I don't like who I am when I'm with them. Why? because it's the defilement that I feel in their presence. I remember years ago, I was around someone who was bitter all of the time, and I happened to be in the presence of this person quite regularly. I remember that I could actually feel when I walked in the room, I could feel the bitterness in me rise. Why? Because it's though that individual was dragging that out of me. It's like something in that was was calling the bitterness that's deep within my heart out to the surface. And I didn't like who I was when I was around that person. And so we must take supervisory oversight. We must do two things. And I wrote them down in my journal and I want to share them with you today. That is these two things. Recognize where we lack strength and then run away. Recognize and run. So what is the bottom line? What is this verse teaching us to practically do? First of all, the very first thing that we should walk away with is this. Be mindful that there are those who claim Christianity who are really not Christians at all. And while they are falsely pretending to be of Christ, they're actually serving to spoil the entire field with roots of bitterness and destruction. Secondly, we have a responsibility to look out for one another in the faith, to make sure that the ones who are within the faith are staying close to Jesus, that they are staying in the word, that they are pursuing the heart of the Father. And if they aren't, that they must be held responsible. Galatians 6 verses 1 through 2 says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit in gentleness. Keep watch over yourselves, lest you be too tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. 
And then let's look at James 5, verses 19 through 20. It says this, My brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back the sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So we have a responsibility. We often don't look at it that way. We often think, well, it's their life. Maybe they just want to act that way and maybe they just want to believe something crazy and they want to live an immoral life. It doesn't hurt me in any way. Yes, it does. Scripture tells us that it doesn't just hurt them. It corrupts many. The next thing is we have to keep watch over our spiritual lives. Diligent watch. This means over who we do life with, who we listen to, what we listen to. There is a real threat that by allowing ourselves to be intermingled with the world and its sinners, we will unknowingly grant permission to the poisonous root that may kill us if we aren't careful. Take a look back at the Israelites in the wilderness in the Old Testament. Scripture tells us that there was a mixed multitude. This is talked all throughout the Old Testament. There was this mixed multitude of Egyptians that came and traveled with the Israelites on their way to the Promised Land. And in part because of this mixed multitude, the Israelites paid a heavy price. They paid a price by wandering in the desert for 40 years, by disease, by famine, by the inability to see the promise which they had placed their hope in for so long. Now back to 1 Corinthians 5.11 verse one more time. It warns us in this verse to not even eat with such people. This is because there is significant importance in keeping the church pure. And by not doing anything that would seem to imply that the Christians are patrons or friends of those who are wicked. Again, remember that this is speaking of those who profess to be Christians, those who are drunkards, or those who abuse their Christian freedom. If a man was on terms, on intimate terms with such people as these, they could be misrepresented as Christian believers. I want to suggest to you that sometimes an entire separation and withdrawing from all communion is necessary. In these times, it was necessary. In these biblical times, it certainly was. And that was to save the church from scandal and from injurious reports that would spread around and be circulated in that time. The pagan accused Christians of all manner of crime and abominations. And these reports would have great injury to the church. Hence, it became necessary in this time to withdraw entirely from them, to withhold even ordinary courtesies of life with them, to draw a line in the sand and to separate themselves from them. Now, this might seem cruel for us to think this way in today's day and age. It might not be a total end-all, be-all rule for today, but I think it's important for us to consider. Pay attention to the compromises that you see Christians making today. This is a huge one. I was talking to a friend of mine just last week, and we were discussing what we see as the demise of the capital C church in recent years. It was a heartbreaking conversation, but it was necessary. Christians, we are called to watch and pray, to watch, to be on the lookout for those so-called Christians who are misrepresenting Jesus. Some of the questions that we have to ask ourselves as we look out in the world and we see these so-called Christians are this, are they living biblically or are they chasing the world? Some questions to ask are, who are they following? Are they seeking worldly gain? Are they compromising by adhering to worldly thinking, things like the acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community, critical race theory, adherence to a watered down gospel that removes all of the need for heart repentance and refusal to live in corruption, overall justification for immoral lives. These are the things that we need to be on the lookout. If you feel that you are experiencing any of these things or seeing any of these things within your church community, within your Christian circle, they are red flags. Be responsible, recognize, and then run. You and I, those of us who are seeking diligently after Jesus Christ, have a responsibility to be surrendered to purity. Purity of heart, purity of mind, purity in our actions, in our thoughts, in our deeds. 
And while we're not personally responsible for people and their personal growth and their adherence to Christian values and morals, we must watch over our own souls so that we aren't corrupted by their defilement. We are responsible for how we allow sinfulness and immorality and all of the ungodliness to take root within our lives. Because let's remember, God holds me accountable for my behavior and my actions as it relates to how I am treated, how I am mistreated, how I am dealt with, in who I am in community with. I am responsible for how I think, how I act, how I behave, and what I do with the opportunities that God has given me. We must make good use of His divine grace. At the end of the day, I am responsible for me. And I don't know about you, but that gives me great reassurance. I'm not responsible for other people, but I certainly am responsible for my behaviors, my actions, my mindset, and my heart, and how I allow the root of bitterness to grow within me. Watch out, friends. Take supervisory oversight. Pray how to handle the ungodly people in your life. Pray for protection over becoming ungodly. It matters. It matters more than we think. Watch and pray, lest we allow any of the negativity in this world come inside of our hearts, corrupt our lives, corrupt our thoughts, corrupt our morals, corrupt our tendencies, incline us to evil. Pay attention to things around you. Pay attention to other people, especially people that you are following in your Christian circles, in your Christian community. It matters. It matters. And you do not want to be responsible for the defilement that is attached to you because of the things that other people are doing, saying, or believing. So I pray, friend, that this has been an encouragement to you today. I hope that this has been an eye-opening video for you. I hope that you are getting into your word and reading it for yourself every single day. You know, it doesn't take a long time to get into the word, to read a few verses every day, and to ask God to transform your life over what it is that you are reading. Allow the word to define what the word means. Allow the word to inform you. Don't take my word for it, friend. Open your Bibles and get into it for yourself. It is a beautiful thing, and you will meet Jesus on the pages of his word, and you will be radically changed, I promise. I am praying for you, friend. If you like this video, would you give it a huge thumbs up? Would you comment down below? What kinds of things did you get out of today's video? What are your thoughts? I would love to know. Subscribe to this channel. Become a part of this family. Hit that notification bell to be notified every time I upload content. Don't forget I upload videos on Tuesday, Thursday, and a Bible study every single Sunday, and I am already looking forward to next week's study. So stay tuned. We've got some great things coming up ahead, and I look forward to being with you again for another sit-down video just like this one. Be on the lookout this week for a vlog, my first time that I have ever done that, but my daughter is helping me to do that this week, and so be on the lookout for that coming to you in the next few days. I pray that you have an awesome day with Jesus. Thank you again for being with me and I'll see you later. Bye friends.